and then all right uh, as I was telling folks I tried to give this presentation uh, or similar presentation last year uh, did not go well um, but I've learned a whole lot more about iNaturalist since then and so I can speak with uh, uh, more authority on the situation and hopefully my uh, typo here is the only mistake that I'll have in the whole uh, program here. So um, Ed said I should have a, a outline. So um, talk about some early coleopterists. I uh, um, find uh, entomology inseparable from the history of entomology. So I like to uh, add a little bit there. Um, beetle collections important to Texas. Uh, a little shout out to Carl Steffen of Latimer County, Oklahoma. Uh, then we'll get into more of the iNaturalist uh, explosion of observational data, uh, discussion of uh, bug guide and iNaturalist, uh, distribution of beetles and peoples, and um, iNat numbers versus uh, Ed's uh, beetle diversity uh, estimations, and how to go small. So. Um, if I say Ed anywhere through this talk, it's going to be Ed Riley. Um, so uh, one of the first entomologists, probably the first entomologist to come through parts of Texas was uh, Thomas Say in the Long Expedition. And this is a really uh, fascinating book by another entomologist, Howard Ensign Evans, who's a hymenopterist. And he was in um, Colorado and Kansas for a while which is uh, where the uh, long expedition passed through. They um, had the uh, engineer in can or cantonment, I believe, uh, on the Missouri River where they overwintered and that's considered the first biodiversity survey in North America. And then they, the next uh, year they headed out, hit Pikes Peak, came through the panhandle and ended at uh, Fort Smith in Arkansas. <laughs> Um, really fascinating. The first, uh, not just the first entomologist, but the first uh, scientific um, expedition, the Lewis and Clark expedition was uh, more explorers. And uh, so the um, Long expedition uh, named after the uh, Stephen Long, the leader of the um, expedition. Uh, and so uh, Thomas Say here, um, was part of that, and he's uh, mostly known for Coleoptera, although there's uh, uh, the uh, Say's um, uh, flycatcher, um, is named for him. Next, uh, uh, survey through Texas that had uh, folks collecting beetles and other insects was the uh, Mexican United States Boundary Commission. Um, uh, Texas became a uh, part of the union 1848. And um, one of the expedition members is buried in the cemetery at Santa Ana there. And um, the beetles from this expedition along from you know, the Pacific Ocean to the uh, Boca Chica uh, mouth of the Rio Grande, uh, a lot of those were sent to uh, uh, LeConte. The, uh, first resident uh, person collecting beetles and other insects was uh, Horace Haldeman, and he was with uh, uh, Army uh, of Texas and uh, the Civil War, the wrong side, if you will, and uh, then back with the U.S. Army. But he retired to uh, Bell County, and uh, he was also uh, Fort Hood. Gatesville. So this is kind of uh, where he ended up and collected a lot of beetles and other insects and sent them to his brother, Samuel Haldeman, and also to uh, John LeConte. Um, a couple of uh, Haldeman eye uh, beetles here that uh, folks probably recognize. Um, uh, John LeConte. Uh, amazingly described approximately half the insect taxa known in the United States during his lifetime, including almost 5,000 species of beetles. Um, he has two birds named after him, 
uh, one of which was uh, named after him by uh, Audubon himself. So um, the uh, Rio Grande Valley is uh, what this map represents, Brownsville here. And this was uh, Charles Schaefer, and he collected a lot at Esperanza Ranch. Uh, this is a uh, oxbow to us former Yankees or Rosaka to local folks. And um, Palm Grove uh, is right here, uh, or no, excuse me, San Tomas is what it was called. This is right here, the uh, uh, Audubon Sanctuary is now uh, managed by Gorgas Society. But um, uh, these are the um, lines that uh, Spain divided up the land uh, along these lines. Here's Fort Brown and um, you see some walking paths and uh, you know, this might be the, the road out to uh, Port Isabel here. And so when uh, Charles came down in the early 1900s, the only way to get to Southmost Texas was either taking a steamship from Galveston to uh, Port Isabel here on the coast or taking a stagecoach down from uh, Corpus Christi. So uh, he made uh, three or four, I don't know if he made five trips, he made a number of trips and he um, collected widely uh, in terms of uh, Beetle diverse beetle families uh, out of 26 families. He collected and described them himself. And one of the uh, int more interesting beetles um, is this uh, Brented here, a primitive weevil. Uh, he was presented with two species, two specimens uh, that were collected in 1904. And then uh, Texas A&M had a uh, graduate student, Jonathan King, who um, uh, had a graduate project to look at beetle diversity of the Rio Grande Valley, and we collected two more specimens. And I think this species, correct me if I'm wrong, known from four specimens collected uh, about 100 years apart. All right, I'm going to escape out of this real quick to because I'm not seeing more folks uh, see if anybody's trying to get in here. Um, all right, there we go. Um, uh, meeting is being recorded. Um, all right, sorry, if I'm uh, gonna have to, uh, whoops, okay, we're back and we're back. All right, so um, that's kind of the little uh, thumbnail of early beetle collecting history. Um, now talking about some of the collections that are important to Texas. Um, a and M, of course, uh, UT collection, Texas Tech, and uh, up and coming is a Corpus Christi Museum of Science and History uh, that uh, Ash is uh, working on. Um, so uh, the specimens that uh, Schaefer collected went to the National Museum, the Smithsonian, and uh, other known Coleopterists, uh, their collections were also in the Smithsonian, and the, these are just a you know tons of people came through. But uh, these are some of the early collectors, and uh, and they were collecting species that were described. And so why why is that important? I'm going to go ahead and close this door here. Um, the um, survey of Rio Grande Valley that I mentioned of beetles, uh, the grant that uh, was written included two days to go to the Smithsonian to look at the specimens that were deposited there that uh, Schaefer and I guess other folks had described in um, early 1900s when they were described. They uh, <clears throat> didn't use the same standards of describing species that we have now. So the descriptions were uh, a little vague, I assume, is uh, one of the main reasons. So you know, they went to look at the type specimen, the, the singular specimen that that species name is tied to that was deposited at the Smithsonian. And uh, just uh, why the, um, 
there was a cluster of coleopterists that were sent to the valley in the early 1900s because that was when the uh, boll weevil first came to the U.S. Brownsville, and uh, so the Texas legislature uh, started the entomology department here at A&M from the based on that boll weevil. So uh, a lot of history down there. Um, uh, so why is the uh, Ohio State uh, University collection important? Well, um, uh, uh, Joseph and Doris uh, Knoll Mike, we can't hear you anymore. Okay, I, it's my thing is blink, blinking, so I need some batteries. I think I have some here in my. Let me get this out of your way here. Oh, oh, you're good. Whoa, that would have. <laughs> All right, it should be hearing me now. Is that correct? Correct. All right, thank you. Um, so I was just uh, talking about early collecting. Um, Ohio State has uh, a lot of specimens, surprisingly rich in uh, beetles from the Southwest due to the nulls collecting activities before the highway system was uh, established and a lot of Knowles uh, type specimens went to the Field Museum. Uh, the surrounding collections around Texas are important. Uh, Florida State large collection, um, I got in parentheses, I'm not sure how directly important it is to uh, uh, Texas, but um, Museum of Comparative Zoology is where Haldeman and LeConte and a lot of other uh, early beetle collector specimen type specimens are. So those are uh, important collections. The uh, Texas Tech, uh, Lois and Charlie O'Brien were uh, curators there and they did uh, a lot of surveys looking at, for one thing, looking at insects that feed on prosopis, mesquite that is being a pest uh, elsewhere in the, uh, where it was introduced uh, overseas. And so they're looking for biocontrol agents and uh, their collection was ultimately deposited at the uh, Arizona State University recently. So, um, all right, so that's a little overview on some collecting uh, collections of importance. Uh, Carl Steffen, shout out. Um, uh, I never met uh, uh, Carl. Um, but his collection is now here at uh, Texas A&M and uh, one of the most thoroughly documented pieces of real estate uh, for beetle diversity. And so that's the approximate location of Latimer County and his uh, 3,500 beetle species uh, exceeds the number of bird species in South America. So that's... Uh, kind of mind boggling. The INAT number of beetles for Latimer County is around 120 though. So 
INAT numbers aren't actual measures of diversity. Um, uh, and so uh, Latimer County is right above kind of where the uh, fire ant quarantine is. So anywhere up here is uh, that's some beautiful land and it's uh, uh, really rich. Uh, Ed got his start up in uh, Missouri there. Um, so uh, just a little side note there on uh, um, Latimer County. All right, I'm gonna uh, escape out real brief and check to see if anybody's trying to join us. I'm gonna admit all and try to jump back in. All right. Mike, was the statement about the fire and quarantine relevant to the bill collecting or just a statement of fact? Both, I guess. Um, he his diversity was above the fire ants, so the, the yes, okay. yes, in general, yes. Um, all right, so now we're into uh, era of uh, mega observational data, and uh, so here's uh, specimen data. This lower line. And the observational data is now going uh, exponential at this point. But th this is not um, species data. If we were looking at species diversity, the specimen line would be up here and the observational line would be down here. So, um, and so another uh, key point of this uh, millions of uh, observational data going into GBIF, uh, one billion are just, uh, I say just, one billion are eBird observations. So this is, um, this is a billion right here. So uh, the, um, so a lot of birds are driving a lot of the observational data. All right, so eBird is a birding uh, database that's probably the largest uh, separate database. And uh, most databases now contribute their data into GBIF. So you can get the, um, it's like the umbrella database. And uh, iNaturalist was founded in 19, or excuse me, 2008, uh, 58 million uh, research grade observations. iNaturalist is one of the larger, probably top five databases, uh, biological databases in the world, uh, biodiversity databases. And I believe last year to 2020, 750 uh, research papers were published using iNaturalist data. Um, so Bug Guide has uh, a million two records of which 500,000 are considered research grade in that they are identified to species. The um, iNaturalist, I'm using research grade in quotes, basically 500,000 species level records as equivalent of, of, I should put a little equal sign there, research grade. Research grade is, is iNaturalist terminology. And uh, they have uh, 54 million research grade, but this is for iNaturalist, we're talking all taxa globally and bug guide research grade species level identifications, arthropods, US and Canada. And uh, so bug guide uh, 2003 started and iNaturalist 08. Um, so we're, we're getting a lot of, um, data uh, going through the roof, a lot of bird data. Invertebrates are, are coming along. Um, observations, not, not, this is not species, this is observation. So there's, there can be a lot of common species uh, mixed in there. All right, so just um, uh, over 2000 databases from around the world. Uh, most databases, data sets have less than 2 million records. And uh, uh, so I use uh, GBIF a lot. Um, so here's uh, Texas A&M uh, insect collection records. 
that have been entered into uh, GBIF. And this isn't all the record, all the specimens that they have are not, um, have not been retroactively collected the label data. At one time, Ed had 22 student workers cranking away on the keyboards, retroactively collecting label data and, and entering it into a um, uh, database that was then uh, shared with uh, GBIF. So uh, somewhere up here, growing particularly, I think it's somewhere uh, last three decades, it's, it's really uh, taken off. So a uh, little heavy on Mexico uh, and uh, Texas and surrounding states, but uh, obviously a global uh, collection here uh, on this floor of this building here. So these are just uh, what I'm using when I'm identifying stuff and uh, checking, cross-checking uh, if necessary. Uh, and I, this little red, all these arrows could go both ways, but the red one here is because when they, the iNaturalist gets to research grade, they go into GBIF. Um, and uh, the same should happen with bug guide in terms of when they get to species level identifications, they should also be cross-checked uh, with GBIF um, or cross posted to GBIF. Uh, this is the plant site I like to use, Bonap. Um, versus the USDA. Uh, USDA is good for checking taxonomy issues and such, but I like the mapping of uh, Bonap here. Um, and I, my Texasento website, texasento.net, um, has a lot of thumbnails. I think that's the strength of my uh, website. And then I, um, every beetle page, every beetle species in Texas, um, uh, every info page on bug guide that has a beetle that incurs in the range extends into Texas. I've generally, I've tried to add as much as I can to uh, that information there on the bug guide info page. So uh, bug guide does some things uh, quite well, some important things like uh, life history, habitat, um, and iNaturalist does other things really, really well. Um, so there's a, a little bit of crossover on what they do. Uh, iNaturalist, of course, uh, their range maps are, are really superb and uh, generally uh, point maps, uh, whereas uh, Bug Guide is, the map is, is statewide, but the data is kind of county. You can look it up by county. It's harder to, to get the data out of uh, bug guide, but um, still important there. I'm going to do another quick check to see if anybody's trying to yeah, get. Yeah, a lot of people use both in tandem. You know, we switch back and forth between them. Yes, and when there's when there is a um, when there's a question on uh, I naturalists of what's being seen. Uh, invariably to support the position, they'll say, hey, look what I found on bug guide. There's a specimen that matches and that's, um, yeah, this, this, this supports my contention that this is species X going. So, uh, but you know, bug guide is, is uh, available to us here in, in US and Canada. And I, I would submit that bug guide is the foundation of uh, a lot of the um, growth of iNaturalist here, at least in the invertebrate section of iNaturalist here in, in North America. So uh, just a little early history of bug guide started in uh, 2003 by this gentleman here, uh, Troy Barlett and uh, Bartlett, excuse me, and uh, now it's run by um, John Van Dyke at Iowa State as professor, and uh, Mike Boone uh, established the mapping system here. So uh, it became more than uh, uh, in shortly after it was established in 2003. It was transferred to Iowa State in 2006. All right, so. Um, uh, this is interesting. 
uh, so these are these are the years here going back to 2014 and the um, <laughs> photographs per month per year and they're kind of uh, tightly clustered and when I did this talk last month I hadn't added in 2020 and there there was uh, at that point there was no drop off in uh, photos added to bug guide but I just uh, last few days I added in 2022 and we can see some drop off here and uh, it's bringing up the bottom of the uh, uh, stack uh, coming through the through the fall and winter months. Um, however, 2020, that was a breakout year for bug guide <laughs> observations, uh, go COVID. <laughs> so I, I don't know if this is COVID fatigue down here in 2022 or, or what, you know. Um, yeah, so it'll, it'll, you know, I don't want to say it'll be interesting to see, but, you know, we'll have to wait and see if uh, the uh, subsequent years are equally uh, down a little bit. But uh, Bug Guide still will always have great photos and great information and uh, will still be a, a bread, bedrock resource in uh, uh, my estimation. So just a little uh, single graph from my thesis, looking at uh, insects available to golden cheek warbler in Western Travis County, surveying the arboreal arthropods on four main trees the warbler um, uh, forages on. And uh, the interesting thing uh, in contrast to the um, uh, peak here uh, midsummer, uh, we have, uh, peak of arboreal arthropods uh, earlier uh, April, May there, March, April, May. Um, so th this is when the birds come and nest. This is, this is the golden cheek warbler prime nesting habitat or season. And every bird, uh, almost every terrestrial bird feeds their young caterpillars. So insects are integral to uh, birds, which uh, uh, gets back to some uh, bird observation data there. Um, so we do see a peak here in iNaturalist data, but that's kind of uh, semi-artificial in that there's a big push for, uh, uh, is it the BioBlitz? City Nature Challenge, and I guess that's global. Um, and I, um, so uh, you can see the. Um, There's a pollinator bio blitz in October, but that's usually a lot less. Yeah. Yeah, there's just a few. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's true. That's true. So the, these um, uh, heartbeat uh, uh, palpitations here, this is the daily. Uh, so this is the the weekend effect here. They have a little pie. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 um, so uh, so 400 million uh, or not 400 4 million monthly per per month uh, records here uh, at the peak. So you can see there's a a because the the peak in the summer months in the northern hemisphere there's a northern hemisphere bias of uh, iNaturalist data. So um, this was last year's, uh, last last year's 2021 uh, year in review. And uh, so this is the uh, 30 million records global all taxa. Um, half of those, uh, uh, 16 million of the 30 million are research grade. They're identified to species. So the, these records out here don't make it into GBIF and our only RG research grade uh, do the, um, uh, so uh, 16 million observations, uh, 200,000 plus uh, species and um, uh, uh, insect, here we got a little more emphasis on insects in uh, iNaturalist than GBIF overall due to the influx of records from eBird as uh, GBIF is a little bird heavy in total. Uh, so here's more, a little more proportional plants, insects, and birds making up the uh, largest 
chunks of observational data. So there was a recent paper saying, hey, you know, we need to get on board, uh, all you experts out there, and and identify these unidentified uh, insects. And true, that'd be great, um, indeed. But the um, algorithms in iNaturalist are in algorithms I'm talking about are the identif they suggest an identification CVS computer vision system I believe is the acronym and uh, it's amazingly accurate occasionally way inaccurate the it, it's not going to know a any no no singleton will um, be identified to species it has to have like 50 records to get uh, get going in the computer vision um, algorithm to identify. So uh, what I'm getting at though is uh, if it guesses wrong or the person who enters it has the final arbitration on what they call it or the initial arbitration, not the final. Um, if, if they call it, um, if they get it in the right branch, taxonomic branch, uh, then uh, or if they get it at the right species, then the second person coming along uh, confirms that and then it immediately becomes research grade. So in that uh, situation, one click, uh, one additional click to get it to research grade. But if it's in the wrong branch or wrong tree, taxonomically speaking, and someone comes and says, no, it's, you know, you, you called it here on the left and it's way over here on the right end of the tree. Um, then uh, it takes three people to uh, confirm that it's, um, that it is that, um, oops, all right, that, that it's uh, to correct it. So, what I'm saying is that, uh, yes, getting uh, experts in here can help move these uh, to research grade, but if the initial folks follow what's suggested and, and uh, they can either withdraw their initial um, uh, suggestion or they can agree with the subsequent suggestion, that would move things towards uh, research grade as well. Um, so the, if this is, this is uh, you know, a lot of this might be correctly identified, but it doesn't have enough clicks essentially to get it to the correct uh, research grade SAS. It takes uh, over two thirds to get it to research grade, two th over two thirds to agree. To, so if one person disagrees and two person two people agree on the correct species, that's not over two thirds. So you have to have three to overcome one incorrect that's not in the, you know, if the, the one quote incorrect is at the genus level and you got the two coming in at the species, then you're good. But if one is at the wrong genus and the following next two are the right genus and species, those, it, it's still not research grade, even though two people. And so the only tax that you're going to get, you know, three people coming in, you know, we're talking butterflies and birds and, you know, the, the popular taxa. So a, um, uh, you know, a, a kind of a semi-obscure beetle is harder to, to move those into research grade if the first person is really wrong and doesn't follow up on the advice of the subsequent identifiers that are generally more um, knowledgeable. Okay. So um, two, two, uh, uh, Danaeus, if I say it's Danaeus plexibus, the next person says Danaeus plexibus, that's research grade, because that's two out of two. So that's more than two thirds. But if There is not. Nope. There is not. But there is, but there is a community of people that will go back and tell people, no, you can't do that. You, you can, you back, can. Go back it up to genus or something, or pull it off of research grade and make them a more work. So that happens. 
you, you can message them, but sometimes you they're on to you know they're trying to get you know all the uh, you know they're trying to get their numbers up, and so they're not looking backwards; they're going forwards, and so uh, identifications can get mired in the uh, casual or needs ID or down here instead of the research grade. Yes. Greater than two thirds. Yes. So that's a uh, and and so if 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 no the other, no other criteria. No other criteria. And sometimes genus can get you can get through that by genus. See, there's a little box that you check if you can't. There are some species. You that that that's species. just confusing people. We won't go on that. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, I'll do just one more. Uh, you know, if, if someone is in, you know, uh, the wrong genus and someone agrees with that, then it takes four yeah. to overcome those two. Uh, so it, it, even three correct isn't even enough if there's two wrong. So it's, it, so it's, it's not just incumbent, in my mind, on the experts to do their bit. I'm uh, calling out the, the folks contributing the data to, to go back and, and look at what you're entering and uh, you know. IMAT is not infallible. I mean, really, there's a lot of bad IDs in there. I'm going through this right now, and I've been through it several species, I mean, a handful, of, where I thought I really knew that species. I ID all this stuff. Other people thought they knew it. So we've got a lot of IDs like that, and then somebody comes through who knows more than we do, and it's all changed. I'm going through this with prairie sunflower, a very common plant. I've found out that what I've been calling that all these years is not prairie sunflower. It's cucumber leaf sunflower. Yeah, so that, that's... I'm going back through that, hundreds of IDs that I have made. And right now, I'm just pulling them off because I'm saying I yeah. really don't know yeah. anything about Yeah. So, so there, there's there's shortcomings, um, and uh, you know if uh, if a beetle or any insect on bug guide, the someone says, "Hey, it's uh, Danaeus plexippus," and it doesn't get moved to uh, that image, doesn't get moved to that species page, even though it's been identified, it's still not research grade. So there, there's these the databases have these shortcomings. Uh, so let's you remember the exponential increasing uh, number of observations. Well, that's they they iNaturalist loves pointing that out, but um, this is uh, you have to dig a little bit deeper to get to some of the um, uh, their peak in uh, a newly added not newly described, but new species newly added to iNaturalist uh, actually peaked in May uh, 2019, about uh, 200 species, new species added per day um, back then. So now we're down to here, um, maybe hopefully a plateau and not a you know decline, but we're at like 70 new species per day. Um, so this is a global all species, uh, all taxa and uh, so you can see a little timeline here on the bottom here. So um, it's a uh, so um, <clears throat> uh, just one percent of the uh, more than uh, 1.7 million folks uh, registered iNaturalists account for more than 60 percent of the uh, platform's observations. And um, you know you're saying, oh Mike, I can't ever get to one percent of anything. Well, not so true. Um, so uh, this is uh, November last year. There was uh, 17,000 INAT beetle observers in Texas, and so the top 20, not top 1%, is 200 uh, beetle observers, and the 270th observer observed 37 species. So uh, very low bar to get to 1% because there's so many people that the, the the platform is very popular. So you have a lot of people, you know. Uh, entering five insects and and you know they may be mostly doing birds and oh add, there's not a bird I'm here's a bug here I'm gonna add that in so um, this is this is just um, 
data for, for the top, you know, a demonstration of what 1% of beetle observers means. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a higher number for butterfly observers because, you know, more people observe butterflies. So, you know, 37 beetles, uh, you know, if you do three, three new beetles a month in a year, you're in the, the 1%. All right, so uh, let's talk about uh, biogeography, uh, something I'm not really an expert on, but um, uh, have thoughts on the topic. Uh, how are species distributed? Age old question. I don't, I don't know, is, there, is biogeography still a topic taught in university level and not so much? <laughs> it's a, it's a, a, a one lecture or something maybe, you know. No, Mike, it is done. Okay, I'm getting, uh, was that you, uh, uh, Dr. Legall? Yeah, uh, that was me. All right, so yeah, I'm, I'm joking a little bit. Uh, so, let, but let, it's a fascinating topic as you will see. Um, whoops. So uh, are they distributed by ecoregions, temperature, precipitation, host plants? Uh, let's go down the list. Um, so these are uh, ecoregions. This is the EPA. I like the the uh, large maps. You know, it'd be nice to have Canada and Mexico uh, here. The um, you know you do see some ecoregions are co correlated with uh, high endemism. Uh, uh, what did I say? Anyway, so you know the Sky Islands of of Arizona. The the Sonoran Desert, the Chihuahuan Desert, the Tamalipan Thorn Scrub, Gulf Coastal Plains, uh, South Florida Coastal Plains. Uh, so th these areas do have uh, uh, endemism going on. Uh, sometimes it's just the, the northern range of a species, but sometimes uh, species are truly endemic to these uh, ecoregions, uh, South Florida, for instance. Um, and a lot of that happens, a lot of eco-regional endemism in California, which I am uh, totally not an expert on. Um, but I think it's a little bit better to talk about these eco-regions as having um, uh, different species abundances than actual species restricted to these uh, eco-regions is probably a better way to, to think about it. I'm going to nod from Ed. Um, so, uh, so here's, uh, so, right there, there's, yes. So I, I'm, we're, we'll talk more about those eco-regions here in a minute. Uh, so temperature, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of species that are, uh, down here, the Southern coastal plains, um, and, uh, and whatnot, but you know, there's often the uh, you know, and some species do go across the southern U.S. Um, um, but uh, a big distributional factor is uh, precipitation and moisture, right? Um, there's a lot of eastern U.S., eastern North America, southeastern U.S. Um, so this is uh, uh, one of the main um, factors uh, dealing with species uh, ranges. Um, a lot of southwestern species, a lot of eastern North American species, a lot of western North American species, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, people, where do we like to hang out? Well, um, I'm going with eastern North America and, and Pacific Coast here. Um, you know, uh, Phoenix, uh, that's artificial, you know, without the, you know, redirecting a whole river, uh, Colorado River, you wouldn't have, am I I'm pointing at Phoenix? No, we're not pointing at Phoenix. There we go, Phoenix over there. Uh, sorry about that, all my Western uh, participants. Uh, so, <laughs> so Phoenix, artificial Vegas, let's, let's call it what it is. So some of these peaks out here aren't even uh, natural. Um, you know, you can, uh, you know, uh, El Paso, um, but you know, some of these are inflated as well. Um, but the, I'm going to talk about I-35 and I don't have a, a I-35 map here, but, um, Laredo, Austin, Dallas, um, I'm going to get up here so I can read, uh, Wichita, um, then Kansas city, then, 
uh, I guess it goes up here to uh, uh, Canada. Um, so it, it, it on the outer edge of the eastern distribution of people here. So, um, uh, all right. Um, I think we got everything there. Um, so if you uh, follow, you know, your biologist, uh, you know, there's uh, all kinds of sayings and, and such, you know, you can't protect what you don't know. That, that's a golden goodie. Uh, little things that run the world, uh, E.O. E. Wilson fans. But um, Carrie Steltzer uh, had this on her INAT page, people need biodiversity and biodiversity needs people. And I would have said, that's crazy. That's, that just makes no sense. We need to get rid of all those people, you know, <laughs> make room for the Beatles, you know. Um, but, uh, well, she was writer, you know, in terms of, uh, certainly in terms of um, discovering that diversity um, is the case I'm gonna make. And so here I wrote in, uh, so this is beetle species per state or province. Here, so I kind of geeked out a little bit, just a little bit. Um, Texas, we go, oh, go Texas. Um, so we got uh, four, four here: Texas, California, Ontario, and Quebec. Uh, they've got several things in common: um, large areas, and uh, large areas being correlated with uh, large species count. What do we call that? island biogeography theory, right? Uh, these aren't islands, but uh, they, we can see them in that light. Uh, indeed, so if, if you combined uh, Pennsylvania and New York, they would be in the 2K range, right? So um, uh, I wanna point out here on the bottom, uh, Nuevo Leon, Monterey, largest industrial city in Latin America. And so that, that has of the border towns, border states, not towns, uh, Nuevo Leon has the most beetle species, but the actual most diverse state in border states is Tamaulipas. And, and it's, uh, you know, tied in the lower end of the uh, beetle diversity in, um, uh, so there, there is a, in addition to the correlation of large size, large population is uh, correlated with uh, higher diversity in iNaturalist terms, in terms of being uh, recorded and such. So let's see, I did the Nuevo Leon, New York. Oh yeah, so look at, look at this, this is crazy. Arizona, 16K beetle species, or 1.6, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 1,600 beetle species, Arizona, boom, 1,600 in New York. What's the blanks going on? A lot of people in New York. Uh, and they got, you know, it's, the people are kind of concentrated there uh, down here, and you see you do have uh, Adirondacks and such, so there's open land there, but that, that's, that's fascinating. And I can't speak to this uh, exactly, but I think uh, Arizona needs to step up their iNaturalist uh, observations there. Um, so here's, here's two side by side. Um, Ontario actually has quite a bit larger population than Quebec. Uh, why, why is uh, Quebec higher? Uh, because we're, we're seeing that there is a uh, correlation with um, population and uh, reported diversity. So I looked into the two um, uh, provinces of Canada and Quebec has uh, eight provinces. You know, if you can't go way up here, but all the people are down here in the, both in Ontario and Quebec. So the, the, these extra provinces aren't really, shouldn't be a factor in iNaturalist beetle diversity. There is a third province, but these are kind of narrow provinces. So I have the, the effective provinces here in parentheses, effective in terms of not counting the 
upper province, upper eco regions that people aren't generally inhabiting. So, um, so anyway, the bottom line is I looked even closer at the um, Quebec situation. There's one guy in there that's uh, crazy about beetles, and so that's why that one's over the top. So here's the here's the population. Here's the population. So Ontario has uh, uh, 14,000. Uh, if I've got that right, I don't think that is right, but maybe. Um, and Quebec is is uh, almost half of that, or not, you know, maybe 60% of that. Anyway, so that's that's okay. So this is this is uh, uh, really interesting. Um, so the uh, domains. This is something I don't. Uh, not really familiar with, but uh, I think we're going to find that this is uh, uh, actually pretty important here. And we can, if we remember, uh, people like it uh, here in eastern U.S., eastern North America, and on the Pacific uh, coast. There, it's my pointers going out there. So we do. We like. We like it. Uh, uh, we, the, the, you, you kind of have to want to live in the in the uh, Western U.S. and and uh, that's just me talking. Um, so this is uh, these numbers. I should have like a little whatever the uh, approximately one point one thousand. Again, we're looking at beetle species data uh, per state. So that's an average of uh, per. Um, domain here. Um, so here's the, the humid and the tropical and, and such. So uh, where, where is the best place to be on this map for beetle diversity? We did decide it was Texas. Why? What does Texas have going for it? A little bit. This is like a, a it's a uh, ecotone there between the the uh, dry and the um, uh, wet areas there. So uh, again, geeking out here with the uh, beetle diversity of iNaturalist. This is not the actual diversity. The um, uh, because Ed in his backyard here in Brazos County has 2,000 beetles. So uh, iNaturalist has uh, 500 plus uh, beetle species recorded. But um, you, you can see a, uh, uh, you know, I, I put in the numbers for the larger counties uh, corpus. Uh, here's Travis County, uh, Tarrant, and um, Dallas, thank you, thank you. Um, so the top five counties, yeah, there's a, a, a Orthoptera tour going on starting at three if anybody wants to check out. If anyone wants to move forward, this is church, you don't have to be scared of the first. I think those first. numbers are skewed. I think Tarrant County is really skewed. Why would that be skewed? Austin probably jumped up to first place when you you would think that, but I have, I have, I'll, we'll, we'll explore that. I've given this a lot of thought here. So. Well, the interesting thing here is um, a lot of interesting things, but, um, uh, you know, you, you, you accused me of bumping this number up here. I, I heard that accusation. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, nothing wrong with that. Nothing nothing wrong with that. Wrong with All right. So the, uh, the interesting thing is maybe I helped uh, Travis County along a bit, but I have contributed nothing up here in these direct counties. And, and the number two county in the state is Tarrant County. So I have, uh, through, UT has a uh, had a contract with uh, Camp Maxi, uh, Texas National Guard camp that John Abbott uh, was running, and so I did uh, add some beetles here, and I've added uh, there's a, a bio research station here in Oklahoma that I've 
uh, photographed some beetles and I've done some work in that's uh, uh, Latimer County there. I've done some work in Pontotoc County. There's a wonderful uh, nature conservancy property there. So I've done, I've contributed a little bit in the area, but this is all organically uh, derived these numbers here. So the, the, um, uh, so the, let's look at these top five uh, counties here, uh, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Travis, and uh, Rio Grande Valley here. Um, so here's, and I got some peripheral numbers uh, as well. Um, so here are the uh, uh, top five counties with uh, Latimer, um, which is, uh, you know, the highest known beetle diversity in North America at 3,500. That's Carl Steffen's uh, uh, stomping grounds up there. Here's Tarrant County on the edge of, uh, and Dallas on the other side of these two uh, eco regions, the uh, Blackland Prairie and the uh, 29 being the cross timbers here. Here's um, College Station and uh, Post Oak Savannah. Here's Travis, kind of uh, a, a mix of, um, you know, you, you know, a little influence from uh, uh, Cross Timbers to the north and uh, Tom Leap and Thorn Scrub coming up and Edwards Plateau. So this is uh, uh, eco region rich area. Um, speaking of which, Latimer County, uh, we have a lot of uh, east west eco regions, small eco regions. And the um, central Texas has a lot of longer north-south ecoregions. So the species that I'm finding here, myself and many others are finding here in Travis County, they can, you know, they can be the same species in Tarrant County. And so we can, uh, you know, say, hey, I got that, and oh, mine matches. And so, you know, this, e even though I haven't. Uh, entered a single species of beetle in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. These that I did enter uh, and Ed's numbers here that I've photographed a little percentage of, you know, those all help the um, diversity identification in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. So here, here's the, the uh, uh, Balcones fault zone, we got all these fives and sixes and a, and a ringer there. And then so all of this is uh, influencing each other. They're cross pollinating, if you will. They're in, you know, so it's, it's a, uh, they're swimming in the same pool, uh, so to speak. So even though I haven't uh, contributed, there are great beetle folks up here that are doing great things here. Uh, Houston at six, six, nine. Um, so, so th th that's, that's interesting. I don't know that that's, uh, um, uh, I didn't expect that. I didn't expect the, uh, I didn't expect uh, these to be the uh, uh, second highest. They're even higher than the Valley. And this is Cameron County is where we did a massive beetle survey, A&M, we A&M uh, graduate students, Ed Riley, several folks in the room here, Brian, Dan, myself. Um, uh, so, you know, I, to me, you know, lower latitude, higher diversity. Um, but here we are um, up here. So I didn't expect that. So a lot of people here, a lot of uh, eco-regional um, cross-pollination, if you will, and also that ecotone. Um, east-west uh, divide here. So if, if you're in, in uh, you know, anywhere in the uh, Blackland Prairie to increase your numbers, probably you want to go east and west more than north and south. You kind of have uh, a little overlap in species diversity there. Dallas is not developed? No, no, no. Uh, due to development. So like the development in Dallas probably isolating several or one species over a long period of time. 
I'll, I have about 10 examples that we're going to look at that broadly look at that question, I think. And so th those, they're, they're 10 that I've cherry picked that kind of anecdotal, but I think they uh, are going to be interesting to look at uh, some factors in this uh, diversity here. So, um, yeah, so, uh, all right. And uh, the top beetle species observers, uh, loosely a lot of folks in North Central Texas and then uh, folk, you know, a few of us here in Central Texas uh, and then a uh, gentleman out in Corpus. But th these are where these folks are, are based. This is, they're not just collecting in their county. They're uh, the um, uh, Maco, he's all over South Texas and he has a, uh, leads uh, birding tours out in the Gulf. So he's got uh, bird data throughout the Gulf of Mexico. So this gentleman is, th these are just where folks are based here. So I'm just throwing that out there that there's uh, the top uh, species of beetle species observers are, you know, Blackland Prairie and, and uh, uh, with with one not so much so here's my number 1800 species there um not to brag or anything um all right so uh i was accused uh you know the the travis county is high because of me uh plant vascular plants high travis county uh lepidoptera high i don't do leps i I, I dabble in plants, but I'm not adding anything beyond what's already known in Travis County. Um, uh, going down the line, Hemiptera, top in Travis County. Uh, Hymenoptera, top. Um, uh, Diptera is top. And uh, I did spiders, it was also top. Uh, John left the room. I was going to say I didn't have time to check the Neuroptera, but I suspect they're top there in Travis County, too. I was going to uh, poke them a little bit. Um, so that that's kind of uh, that. When you look at the other taxa, it's reinforcing. It's not just one ringer that is uh, suggesting that Travis County is a diverse urban diversity hotspot. Let's just call it that. And um, now I uh, mentioned several times our beetle diversity uh, survey in Cameron and Hidalgo County. Cameron for beetles is high here. The, um, it's not high um, in an inaccurate way. It's high through a extra effort uh, way aspect. So uh, Cameron County is, um, you know, the, the troop number of, of beetle species in Cameron County, just in the palm grove is a thousand species. So uh, this, these data are from this month here. And the true numbers, certainly for the insects, are all higher than they're showing. But I would submit that as they increase with data, they retain this general shape here. And um, the uh, Cameron County being one of the top five beetle species counties. Um, we'll look at some other data. It's actually not the top five across taxa in terms of what's been observed. It may actually be a top five uh, in true diversity, but looking using the iNaturalist as our metric of diversity, the observational data, uh, Cameron County is actually not uh, top five across taxes, top five in beetles. That's why I have it here. So th th that's, that was like, I didn't expect that. Um, all right, so this is uh, pretty interesting here. Um, so this is uh, iNatural, this is all insect species, um, not plants, uh, not birds, all insect species in the blue line. So we got, uh, for each county, we have two data points. The, the blue is the insect species, uh, which is over here on this uh, y-axis. And then we have the population orange line, which is on the uh, right y-axis. 
or excuse me, left. Um, so is there a correlation between population and reported iNaturalist uh, insect species, insect diversity? Possibly, um, but Uvalde has, uh, I'm not gonna say it has zero population, but they're still at 2000 uh, species here. 2000, this is kind of like the, the, the you know, if you wanna get there, you can number 2000. To get above 2000, you know, a few people trying hard, they can get a county to 2000 or maybe even one. Um, again, across taxa. Um, uh, so the, um, uh, and then, so here's Travis County. It's the number one county. Um, when, so if, if, there, if there is a correlation between population and reported diversity, uh, the second question is, is there a um, uh, upper limit to pop, human population that causes a decrease in reported diversity, which is kind of one of the questions you were uh, in a, answering in a different way than you were asking it, I guess, but uh, it's, that's an interesting thing. Um, I didn't put Houston on here because uh, the, the population is so high, it throws off the, the scale here. But um, I would point out that the, these two low points here are El Paso and Bear County, and so that might be uh, cultural issues there. Um, uh, Hispanic folks might uh, not as culturally into natural history. Um, uh, hate to say that, but um, so let's look at the high points here. Um, Travis County, um, and I got to get in here to check my math here. Um, so this is Williamson County here, and. Uh, Hayes County, and then this is Bastrop County. So we have, we're back to the um, uh, Balcones Fault Zone, Hayes County being San Marcos, just south of Austin, and Williamson County being Round Rock, more or less, north, just north of Austin, and then Austin. So the Balcones Fault Zone, all things being equal, does seem to have actual increased diversity over surrounding uh, counties. Um, so that's all kind of interesting. Here's um, Tarrant County and Dallas. And as you see, um, uh, Hidalgo County is here, um, but Cameron County is way down here. Cameron County is actually not quite in the, in the top five of um, all insect taxes. So when you take out the beetles, uh, Cameron County falls back into uh, some of these other counties. Um, but uh, Hidalgo County is high. Um, McAllen, there's a lot of people there. The Butterfly Park is there. There's uh, a lot of natural history folks uh, spend their winters chasing bugs and birds and, and such, in, uh, more so in Hidalgo County than probably in Cameron County. So. All right, so that, that's kind of uh, interesting. We could talk for, you know, forever on that one. All right, so now here's uh, about 10 species uh, distribution that uh, back up some of the things we've been talking about. And uh, this is a longhorn beetle, uh, Rustica, that uh, <laughs> larvae hosts in nearly all Eastern hardwoods. Uh, those hardwoods uh, extend beyond uh, this eastern line here, uh, the ecotone um, uh, or the domain, the, the ecotone of the domain, the ecotone being uh, the dividing line between east and west. So there, there's uh, a record even up here in uh, Winnipeg there. So you can make a case it's not temperature limited. It's, and it's not host plant limited. Uh, this is a generalist on plants. It's moisture limited here. So that's, that's example one. Example two, um, that's, a nice that's a good old bug there. And so our first bug was uh, fed in dead, dead wood. 
Um, this is a generalist predator for all we know, for all I know, certainly. Um, the uh, Callosoma sei, again, east, west, and there's a, um, another, uh, you know, we got uh, records, whoops, way up here in, in uh, Canada. And um, so it does not seem to be uh, temperature as much as moisture. So we got two, this is just two examples of Eastern species that are not limited by the food they eat uh, or the, what the larvae eat or the adults eat. All right, so here's um, a, another uh, Eastern species that is most common here in Texas. That's crazy. This, uh, sort of crazy, kind of crazy. Uh, Sala casei, this feeds on uh, willows and poplars. Uh, willows are coast to coast. So it's not limited by its host plant, but it, it loves itself some uh, Blackland Prairie there. Um, you know, may, maybe it's the population, I don't know, but uh, 216, 217, sorry, Texas observations. Um, most of the other states, you know, kind of in the single digit uh, number of observations. Uh, so I don't know what the rectangularis uh, hosts on, but again, we've got uh, 200 plus Texas observations, loves it some uh, Blackland Prairie there. It does get west of the uh, central Texas, the I-35 corridor, um, but it's most common right through there. There's a, a pickup in Nueces and, and Harris County um, there. Um, so this is uh, particularly interesting. This one probably is limited by its host plant. The um, one of the uh, two host plants, the oaks that this is known from, is a Quercus buckleyi, that uh, is in these green uh, counties, highlighted green counties, and you can see pretty much the the same uh, distribution of the beetle. Um, so you can say, yeah, okay, that one's uh, that, that one's just on that host, but why is that host just in that? Uh, uh, sweet spot there, uh, I-35 corridor. There are a couple of uh, Rio Grande Valley uh, records here that uh, need further investigation, but we'll ignore those. So that, that's kind of interesting, right? Um, all right, here's a uh, species that ranges all the way up to uh, Winnipeg. Uh, I've confirmed that, and then Ed's uh, catalog also uh, uh, has Manitoba as the one county or one province, one Canadian province that it, uh, this beetle occurs in. This feeds on uh, uh, spotted bee bomb, which Monarda. So uh, Monarda uh, prairie plants, not restricted to uh, the, uh, I, you know, Blackland Prairie here. You know, there are people up here but that Blackland Prairie does stop just south of the Red River. So it, it may be Blackland Prairie that is the um, main influence on this beetle's divert, uh, abundance. The um, plant is much wider, much more widely distributed as indicated by the uh, valid records going all the way up to Canada. Uh, I did look at um, the uh, Texas A&M uh, ample records for this beetle, and they were kind of evenly distributed through uh, Texas here, from uh, East Texas to, to West Texas there. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking um, Ed's rarely, if ever, has said, you know, I need to go collect some beetles. Let me go up to the Dallas Metroplex. That's where I'll get me some beetles. So the uh, even distribution of the A&M records could be uh, due to entomologists saying, you know, get away from those people. Let's go out in the country and collect. So the A&M is under collecting where the beetle may actually be more common. Um, the, um, you know, again, we, we got millions of people here, but, 
you know, there, there, there are people beyond the Metroplex and there's uh, relatively few records outside of that area. I want to briefly go back here. This uh, inset here, this is from my thesis. We had one record from uh, Texas Oak and one record from uh, the Central Texas Live Oak. And this, this one record from Texas Oak was a upper beat. So that, that one beetle from Live Oak came from five meters and above. We had a, a long extending net to sample where the birds foraging at the tops of the trees. So that we, we surveyed the heck out of both the Live Oak and the Texas Oak. We got two records and that, that one record over two summers, uh, we did 80 samples per, um, per every other weekend going out through the warblers breeding season. So that one, one record correlates uh, with what we're, you know, is almost surely that is the primary uh, food plant, the uh, uh, red oak there, buckley eye. All right, so this is interesting, right? What, what do you know about this species? It's a dung beetle. Dung beetle. So, so we're, we've gone past uh, dead wood. We've gone past uh, predator. We've got, now we're looking at, you know, dung. What else do you know about this one? Isn't it an uh, ontophagus? Ontophagus, yes, sir. Uh, gazelle, non-native. I heard that. Or, so we got a non-native species, loves it some Edwards Plateau, you know, Blackland Prairie there. You know, that's crazy. So, you know, if you just go into the a and collection, you know, you, you might not pick up on the abundance right through here. And again, it can, you know, we can say, yes, it's boosted by all those uh, uh, humans in there, but that, you know, they're, you know, that that's probably not overestimated. I think that that's given the, the large data set, I don't have the number of beetles uh, from Texas, uh, but uh, you know, this number goes up uh, almost every day. So that, so we got, we got uh, all kinds of beetle feeding. We got Eastern, we got Western, uh, we got predators, we got, you know, wood feeding. Here's a beetle that feeds in uh, mesquite seeds as larva and uh, mesquite it does extend past the uh, I-35 corridor. So doesn't seem to be limited. Uh, I mean, it is overall limited by the host, but the, the, it's limited in addition to the host. It's also has a preference for the drier habitats than uh, following the mesquite out into the Eastern Texas here. And uh, so here's a Tenebrionid, uh, yet another different feeding strategy. And um, generally detritivore, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and again, kind of a hard, uh, this, this beetle is, this is like the most common Tenebrionid in all of Texas. And it has like a, a pretty hard uh, line there just uh, on the east side of I-35 there. So, you know, you can say, well, you know, given the, this cluster here in Denver, you know, this might be people um, emphasized due to the population in these counties, but, uh, you know, th this beetle is not um, temperature restricted. It's uh, multiple provinces here in Canada, uh, but it loves it's some uh, Edwards Plateau there. All right. So, uh, what, what the heck is going on here? This uh, beetle feeds on mesquite. This is not the only place mesquite uh, is found. Ain't that crazy? What's that? <laughs> no. <laughs> they're, they're, I, I'll, I'll assure you, photographers live in Dallas too. A beetle collector lives there. This doesn't come to lights as much. You got to set traps. I talked to um, Clint King and he said, 
he collected almost all of these from bait traps or lingering funnel traps or beading. So this is this is a uh, false uh, distribution based on all these uh, Tarrant and Dallas County folks photographing what comes into their lights or what sits on their flowers. They're not out there beating and sweeping and trapping and such. So you you set out the traps and then you you know you find some other diversity going on there, huh? Isn't that crazy? That is that is Clint. Clint King. Clint Catanatus. Really. Really. Oh my. Really. Now this is the like the only one, only of all the species I've looked at, I've never seen this night and day uh, clarification of this issue. But but uh, I naturalist is. Uh, Black light centric, uh, sit flower sitting centric, and um, what is the other? You know, those are the main places they they're finding their bugs. So um, they're not rearing, they're not trapping so much. So things that don't come to light are kind of underrepresented. But Clint was entering his trap data into iNaturalist, and you see this uh, incredible dichotomy there. All right, so uh, this is kind of total speculation what I'm going to throw out here. Um, these are um, uh, high diversity areas, uh, I-35, southern uh, corridor of I-35. Um, it's uh, ecotone from east-west. Uh, what do we know about western uh, uh, precipitation patterns? You got your monsoon season. Well, these uh, counties have a, a peak in fall diverse, a peak in fall uh, precipitation that might be from the kind of a, a echo effect of the stronger fall rains out west. And again, I'm just a little speculating here. I'm not a meteorologist either. Uh, nor a biogeographer, but uh, so that that's kind of interesting. The uh, Houston kind of has a straight; uh, it rains every month, it, and a, kind of a, a uniform amount. Um, so that that's kind of uh, uh, potential. Another reason why the I-35 corridor sitting astride east and west might be um, uh, have diversity due to these uh, uh, nice. Uh, fall rains that uh, uh, we see there. All right, so let's compare I, I naturalist data versus um, E.G. Riley actual data, uh, actual diversity data. So um, the, um, um, so rove beetle, um, almost no I naturalist rove beetle to species. There and that's always likely to be that way. Uh, we got uh, ground beetles. Uh, th that's a tough family, right? Uh, get a can I get an amen? Um, uh, scarabs. You got your aphodiines, your small scarab beetles. Uh, so even though they come to lights, getting them to species is a little tricky. And even if I saw. Uh, INAT data research grade for aphodiines, would you believe it? I don't know if I would without checking them all. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it might be better that some of these, you know, stay where in the safe bounds of what can be uh, site identified from photographs. Now, I think the um, leaf beetles, we have, uh, we can grow this. And weevils, I think we can grow this uh, safely. A uh, little dangerous to grow ground beetles, so to speak, rove, aphodiines. Longhorn beetles, you'd think they would uh, be higher percentage. Um, darkling beetles, that's another tough family there a little bit. Uh, Buprestids, you'd think that'd be higher, but you know we got agrilus, so uh, that's you know where we're at. Click beetles, kind of a uh, about half the family is tough for site ID. Um, so uh, lady beetles, you got a lot of skimness, you know, going to be hard to get that. 
Um, so checkered beetles, um, uh, you know, we're about halfway point there. So overall, uh, iNaturalist beetle diversity is about 44% uh, of Ed's uh, studied estimate on uh, beetle diversity for these top five, excuse me, top 12 families, which represent uh, over 70% of the Texas total beetle species. Um, so beetles are about 44% um, uh, less than halfway uh, identified. Um, I'm going to go. I yeah. You yes. Go. Can you explain who or what is E.G. Riley? Who or what <laughs> is E.G. Riley? He's right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Not that way. The other shoulder. That's, yeah, here, here, let, let's, here, I don't think you said it quite into the, say it into the microphone. You are the standard. He is the standard of Texas Beetle. Texas Beetle. Right? Okay. All right, did, did everyone care that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've I've mentioned you once or twice. Uh, um, so uh, all right. So the if you remember uh, way back, we had um, the uh, those the five top counties, and the vascular plant line was on the top, and then Lepidoptera was the second, and then beetles was below that. The the beetle. True beetle diversity is probably greater than the Lepidoptera diversity, but Lepidoptera, uh, the Lepidoptera diversity in terms of uh, INAT uh, observed diversity is um, a higher percentage of the moths and butterflies are uh, site ideable than beetles are. So the true beetle diversity is greater than the Lepidoptera diversity, but because so many of the Lepidoptera are site ideable, that the, the line was above the beetle line on that five comparison of the five counties there. So, all right, um, are we done yet? Oh my gosh. Um, so I, I don't know if I wanna get too much into this. We got uh, two scales left and right. We got uh, beetle observers. These numbers are sky high. Look at, uh, so I circled these um, uh, kind of outliers here. California, sky high beetle observers, almost uh, 40,000 folks, 35,000 uh, beetle observers in California, but they're and then this is the statistic that I kind of made up. Uh, the number of observers who have observed more than 100 beetle species. So that way we don't have one person skewing it. We have to see what the buy-in of the INAT public uh, is. And I put it at, you know, in my metric here, if you have 100 beetles, then that's where I put a, a, a blue marker. So the blue marker for California is um, there's less than 40 folks that have identified 100 beetle species in California. So that, that kind of lets some of the air out of uh, iNaturalist is, you know, in that um, it, uh, I shouldn't have said that, but, um, it, uh, you know, we're still not, you know, Texas here, we got a, a healthy number of, of beetle species observers. We're over 80 have, folks have recorded 100 beetle species in Texas. So again, I can't speak to California very much, uh, but I will throw in a couple of things. I'm, I'm, I'm almost through, trust me. Um, so uh, here's another, uh, 
this is in line with California here in uh, United Kingdom. A lot of folks, 20,000 folks are, are using iNaturalist, but the, the number of folks that have over 100 species is less than 20 because UK doesn't have a lot of beetle, actual beetle diversity. And so, um, and then here's uh, Russia, kind of the other end of the spectrum. They, they don't have, uh, so red is the beetle observers. So they have less than 10,000 observers, but they have, uh, those people are hardcore in identifying uh, species. So they, uh, that's the other end of the spectrum. You have a uh, relatively low number of observers, but you have a, a lot of folks that are, uh, you know, honor more species there. So anyway, the take home message, if there is one, is that uh, Texas is uh, number two in the number of uh, folks with 100 or more beetle species identified uh, to research grade on iNaturalist and only Canada and of course the US are above Texas in that uh, metric that I um, kind of created there. So that, that's kind of interesting. Um, so Texas is at the center of iNaturalist, it's certainly in the beetle world there. So why why is California, again, I, I can't, uh, you know, I've been there a few times, that's about all I can say, but they, they the counties are not uh, equal size the way that Texas counties are. So you have a uh, high density of folks in these small counties. So one of the ways that iNaturalist works is, you know, you go to the county level in, the, in terms of geography, and then you go up to state, and then you go out to country. And so uh, the other thing is uh, California has a lot of tenebrions. I, I find California beetles harder to identify. So uh, uh, as a non-California resident, I find California beetles harder to identify. So that might be why they have fewer research grade because other folks might find them harder to identify. If you got a lot of similar sister species in the brown beetle category, Tenebriana day and such, you know, which one is it? Well, if I can't get it to species, I can't get it to research grade. So, you know, there, there's a lot of factors going on, but, uh, you know, it could be something to do with the, how the counties are all sliced up and the people are kind of concentrated and the beetles, you know, you, you know, if, if you got a small county, you know, you might, not have all the beetles um, uh, uh, identified there as you do in Travis County. If you go, you know, all beetles of Travis, then you're looking, you know, you got to scroll through a thousand species. You know, again, I'm speculating widely on, on all of this. And um, uh, so here's the uh, just map of the beetle uh, records, not just I not not just. Uh, research grade perhaps. And then here's some of their uh, ecoregions. And I know uh, a little bit more about California in terms of butterflies. They don't have great diversity, but they have high endemism. So uh, they, you know, the Xerce blue, uh, former Xerce blue and, and other. So um, just a picture of some of the ecoregions and they have high endemism um, there. It's probably contributing uh, uh, so just, uh, you, you asked who's Ed Riley. Did you not? Here we go. How could you? Um, this is, uh, I've, I've, uh, known Ed since 93. I started volunteering here at the A&M collection, but I didn't really, uh, get heavy into beetles until the South Texas beetle project, which started, uh, uh, end of last decade, uh, or I guess two decades ago, if you, uh, anyway, this is uh, at uh, Boca Chica. There's probably a, a space station right out here. Um, just, uh, so these are the dune, coastal dunes, and uh, there's a uh, Riley eye, uh, Chrysomelid, uh, Ketok Nima, uh, Riley eye that uh, lives out here. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, I've known Ed for a long time, but I really got into beetles uh, with this uh, South Texas Beetle Project. And uh, Ed's not just beetles. He's, he loves him some uh, laps. He, he doesn't like to admit that. But um, you can see this man indefatigable. It's, this is late at night, and he's still, you know, got the juices going there. Field pinning micro moths um, there, and uh, got a little bit of, this is... 
<laughs> the libations or the micro moths? The micro moths. Okay, I'm just checking which. Um, so yeah, this is out of a trap, and the uh, the uh, uh, carton egg, egg cartons are at the bottom of the bucket trap. So and then here's the the uh, field pins out here, and this is uh, yeah that that's uh, that's some se serious dedication there. Um, Ed on the back bench, uh, we, were, we had a, a lady beetle day, lady beetle bug day. Uh, we kind of had to come in on the weekend. They, they wouldn't pay him to work on lady beetles there, I think. So um, so this is our little uh, field setup uh, studio, uh, Motel 6 uh, from the Rio Grande Valley Beetle Project. And all these, uh, these are live vials by uh, similar same collecting events, you know, this black lighting, this is maybe Boca Chica, you know, Palm Grove, uh, Laguna Escosa, you know, beating, sweeping, black lighting, you know, all different locations, different collecting methods. So we, we segregated the uh, beetles by locality and method and then um, uh, poured the beetle out one by one onto my uh, white backboard here and I, uh, uh, photograph them as they're running around on the uh, poster board there and then you know shoot three or four or five photos and then we uh, deep six of them uh, in the uh, uh, and before we do that though generally the working live vial we let it sit on some ice to cool it down a little bit to you know make the beetles a little slower but beetles you know you couldn't do this with flies or you know parasitic hymenopter you know different things um but it's it's a great method for beetle photography let them run around you couldn't do this with moths you know let the moth run around on you know that didn't make any sense uh anyway this was this was great and uh so a, a little more libations or you know maybe we're saving that for later i don't know it's not open we're legal there all right last last slides here uh a lot of beetles are small. A lot of insects are small, and in total, a lot of species are small. Right? If uh, giving that insects make up most species, so the um, th there's there's uh, about a third of the in these two uh, uh, groups of beetles, uh, over 2,000 beetle, 2,000 insects uh, in Germany. Uh, where this uh, was, and they're just looking at a couple, but uh, a third of them were less of uh, wood boring beetles were um, of this variety uh, were uh, less than two millimeters or less than two and a half millimeters. And a third of the true bugs were less than four millimeters. So, you know, about half the insects were less than uh, uh, five millimeters. So, um, you know, this is... Uh, you know, if, if you're doing all, you know, taxa that come into your light, you know, why struggle with a tiny, you know, speck of a beetle when you, you know, there's all these pretty moths here. So, you know, people are want to go for the low hanging fruit, the bigger colorful critters. So that that's part of the reason why the itty bitties, the grit, as uh, Ed would say, um, are kind of overlooked. But I try to get the grit and. Um, so that's why my beetle numbers are a little higher there. And so this is the camera, the lens, the lens, this is a kind of a unique lens up here and it's a manual lens. It's very heavy. Um, and this is a, a, these are images from Ed, or excuse me, Alex uh, Wild. Uh, and so this is one uh, X. Uh, this is about the size of a, a, your basic postage stamp when you shoot at one X, the field of view is about the a one inch square, more or less. Uh, and then if you go to five X, you're shooting at about uh, full frame on a grain of rice. Yes, sir. I do. With a ring light that freezes the motion. No, I don't. Um, uh, but so, you know, you know, probably we no no one you know who knows what the uh, what a bullet ant uh, trap door ant is, but this is a common uh, anthicid that's on our lights, and this is a micro moth wing here that it's uh, carrying around. So the the this common beetle is less than the length of this micro moth wing there. 
So, but if you get, you know, good lens, you, you know, boom, that is a clear as day what that beetle is. All right, so summary, um, observational data increasing exponentially, but species numbers are growing more slowly, yes. Uh, Texas is an active center of iNaturalist data, yes. Cities are working centers of biodiversity, yeah, okay. Travis County is urban diversity hotspot of Texas. I think we can uh, data support that. I-35 corridor slash Blackland Prairie ecoregion slash domain ecodiversity is underappreciated. Um, uh, and iNaturalist is still uh, has less than about half the Texas arthropod species. So, all right, whew. Uh, thank you. And uh, if anybody has any questions, um, uh, I'm gonna ask anybody is, I'm gonna uh, back out of this and go see if there's anybody still, um, oh my gosh, did we, whoops, that's not what we want. Where's where, okay, here we are. Um, I thought we were gonna be right here. All right, and then, all right. Um, so uh, I'm gonna admit Anne right here at the end for the Q&A session if she's still here. Does anybody in uh, Zoom land have any questions? Unmute yourself if you have any questions. I wanna uh, throw it out to anyone uh, in Zoom that has, may have a question. Um, how many people are still, uh, so we still got 40 participants, assuming everyone's still in front of their computer there. So that I didn't, we lost more in the room here than, uh, okay, shoot. Okay. I I agree. I it's all, it's all you know counts and computers and things that you know a, a good statistician ought to be able to make those things sound. Yes. Uh, so uh, the folks out in Zoom land probably didn't hear Ed's question. He was uh, saying that there should be a uh, mathematical statistical way to normalize the data to uh, see how much of it is. Uh, so what you're saying here is that, is that you're, you're looking at one of the big influences on all the clustering of points and things is, is effort. Uh, that's why you have so much around the cities. Everybody lives in the cities and there's a lot of effort there. Well, there is absolutely, but uh, we have Eastern species that come right up to the, the rustica did not have any uh, increased uh, abundance in the corridor. So yeah, again, that's an anecdotal situation. Well, I, I, uh, there's uh, effort is a part of it. Um, and, you know, I can make the counter argument as I did that, you know, you're not going to say, hey, I need some beetles. Let me go up to Dallas and, and see what, you know, what the actual diversity is there. I'm going to go out in the country. Um, right. So, so that, that is, that is a, that's why I left it as ambiguous as, uh, these areas are underappreciated. I left it that ambiguous way that I don't, I, I'm, I'm raising the question as you are, um, how much of this is real and how much of it is effort? I don't think it, it might not even take high powered statistician, but um, I uh, don't have an answer. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, even when you collect, there's no scientific or theory 
a, a limited amount of space that you collect and some people tend to go to Big Ben and they go and they follow the roads. Yeah, so there is a bias there. And now there is a different bias, which is that people have their camera and they can take photos basically wherever they are. So for sure, there will be clusters. Uh, in Texas, there's a lot of private land that is not accessible because people don't know the owner. So for sure, they are not documented, except when people ask for permission. So for sure, we have very few data. Uh, there is data deserts in some way uh, in the state, but everywhere there will be that. And it's a, it's a sampling, in fact, uh, error. And uh, in statistics, you would go with sampling and you, you would check that. It also, I mean, you have the ability when you collect something to actually do dissection and stuff. Well, and with specimens, yeah. Yeah, and, but with, with, you know, the poor eye naturalist people, you know, <laughs> I mean, most of the pictures are. Oh, yeah. Are, and you're are, limited what you're right. getting things to a species. Being an eye naturalist addict. I think a lot of it has to do with being a part of an iNaturalist community. Now I know for a fact that Travis in Williamson County has got a group of iNet, Texas Master Naturalist enthusiasts, and I think they feed upon each other. And the same way, of course, it is with in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Annika and Melody, hello, this is Linda Joe. I saw you everyone yeah, there. <laughs> Right, but, but but anyway, uh, I just think that that is skewing the data in some way. In that the I that psychology. So uh, I'm gonna. Uh, all right, so here we go. Uh, let me. Yeah, I mean, there, there's uh, back to our chrysomelid, uh, you know, that it's almost thick right there. You know, the, you know, you got Waco in there and, and then you drop it into uh, uh, Round Rock down to uh, San Antonio. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that seems, and the fact that it stops right here, I mean, there are, people north of the Red River, it's hard to believe, but, um, you know, that, that, so that, that seems like a uh, Blackland Prairie restricted or not, obviously not restricted, but, uh, you know, it, that, that's the sweet spot. One record. Yes, sir. Yes. When they overlap so much, it's more. Yes. So, you know, so some of this is, uh, uh, you know, this is evenly distributed kind of almost here. That's that's kind of interesting. Um, and and I love, you know, why is that that plant? You know, that's that's not the people effort. You know, that's where that plant is. Um, but this this is uh, presence, absence, not abundance on the. Uh, um, plant distribution there. This is uh, presence, absence, and abundance. Um, so here we have a, a Dallas cluster and a more central Texas cluster. Right here, the cluster, there's so many clustered red um, records. Is the more records, the more correct. Well, the you see a cluster of red squares, so it's uh, it's abundant in that in the metroplex. You can, which yeah, this is a static screenshot of. See here, there's the effort, you know, it, it just barely reaches I-35 here. Right, 
Right, but but th this this goes east and west of the I the um. Well, so here's the this. I think a lot of this, you know, you can throw in the the a post oak and the Blackland Prairie, the parallel nature, and they stop. Uh, at least the Blackland Prairie stops just shy of the Red River. You got a little bit of post oak uh, north of the Red River there, but that's right where that Chrysomelid. Um, uh, Kind of peters out in a in in an abundant way. It it ranges all the way up to to uh, Manitoba, uh, but it's thick uh, on on this. Uh, yeah. But then your beetles stop right there. Then you can be pretty sure it's a, you're looking at a beetle phenomenon. Not a right. Well, I, I don't know that I would put birds. Uh, I would I would do all invertebrates uh, in a data set. You know. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, there's 700 papers on iNaturalist. I, I don't know what those papers uh, entail, what they're exactly looking at, but I, I kind of suspect they're not looking at, you know, they're not zooming in on Texas like we just did. I'll say that isn't so. <laughs> I say, perish the thought. Uh, so. Um, So here, this was interesting. I didn't point this out before, but this is the uh, the state. The state, uh, the land grant has lower number than the. This is like UT and this is like A and M here for New Mexico and and uh, UT we got you know a thousand plus and A and M we got five hundred. You know the epicenter of of you know the greatest university collecting collection, one of the largest university collections in the country and. Uh, you know the the INAT observations don't uh, aren't through the roof the way they are more so in uh, at UT there and then you know well all of these are numbers are going up that's why I try to date all these maps because th these numbers are are going up and up and then here again still water and uh, uh, Norman, Oklahoma, uh, OU here has more than Stillwater there. It's, it's, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that uh, the Aggies aren't uh, getting it done there. Um, well, I think it's population related and uh, effort and, and you know, they're, this is a smaller, you know, so you can break this down on, you know, uh, you know the, these, um, you know, this graph, I could do it by population or, um, you know, there, there's all kinds of different uh, Y axes you can throw in there um, to look at the data and, and uh, get at uh, some of these questions. But uh, yes. Yes. So does anybody in, in the, did that generate any questions out in the Zoom land? Yes. Can you hear me? I can. Yes, sir. Um, I, I just texted you this, but I doubt if you ever get to this uh, running stream of text. But J.W. Green was a naturalist. He, a beetle, um, uh, especially the lampyrids and the cantharoids, he noted a record of the old world firefly genus Luciola in Uvalde. Have you heard of such a record? Have you um, seen, is, has anything further um, developed on that? Old world uh, uh, Lucanid or? No, Luciola, L-U-C-I-O-L-A, uh, it's a firefly. Firefly, um, I, I cannot speak to that at all. Um, Worth a try. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, uh, 
asking about a uh, uh, a uh, old world beetle uh, firefly in central Texas. Um, uh, uh, you know, there, there's strays, you know, you would expect a stray like that to be in a port of entry. So being in the, um, uh, where, where was the location? Uvalde. Uvalde. Yeah, um, uh, that, that's hard to explain. You bet and it is. What's that? The, you bet it is, but the specimen yes. that J.W. Green looked at must be somewhere in, in Tamu or any of these other places that you, uh, Oh, so okay. I don't know. So, so you're wanting to know where the specimen resides. That'd be a good idea. He didn't mention it, so that's the whole thing. So I don't know. And where, where was he, space, was he J. in Uvalde? No, J.W. Green worked on canthroids throughout the Southwest. Oh, yeah. South, South yeah. Central. And so, but where did he live? No, I don't know that. Okay. Um, do you know anything about J.W. Green? The genus Luciola, L-U-C-I-O-L-A. Yeah. Very well yeah. known in Europe, uh, Australia. Okay. Well, you say he traveled around the world? No, no, he didn't oh, do that. Okay. He, he oh, that, just, you're, you're describing the- He just mentioned a note. Of, it was okay. one sentence notes. Okay. And we know nothing else. And so I thought you might have heard of such a thing. I, I, uh, as much as I know about beetles of Texas, that, that, uh, Ben Pfeiffer is your, uh, your, uh, uh, Lampier, uh, your firefly guy that he would be the Texas firefly person that would, I would ask him, uh, first and, um, and ask other fire people that focus on fireflies who I would uh, direct that question to. Fireflies are difficult uh, to identify, right? Um, to species, they're easy. Sometimes a little tricky to get even to genus, but uh, um, I can't speak to uh, almost anything on the uh, record you're asking about. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Any other questions in uh, Zoom land? So, um, uh, well, I, we might be uh, coming to an end then if we don't have any uh, more questions. Um, so I hope that was um, thought provoking. If, uh, uh, if I didn't answer, obviously probably raised more questions than we answered, but uh, I appreciate everyone uh, coming in and uh, since I did record this, I should be able to uh, upload it to YouTube shortly and uh, we can uh, subject others of our friends to this uh, presentation by sending them the link. I know a lot of people um, uh, were occupied here on this uh, Saturday afternoon. So um, some people actually want to be subjected to this. So, all right. Um, if, if that's it, we will uh, adjourn. Thank you, everyone, for your... Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> A little applause there. That was... Uh, so, all right. Thanks, Mike. Um, so... Thanks, Mike. Uh, take care, everyone. I, I appreciate folks... Uh, 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 logging in from across the, the country and beyond. Um, so um, uh, something to think about. Take care, everyone.